So let's have Welcome to the uh, 10th I Am Caring Movement uh, for the uh, convention. We are here in Kiev and uh, we are a group of people coming from uh, actually more than 10 different nations here. And again, we meet now since about five years uh, because we want to uh, lead change towards a caring society. And uh, what we would like um, to discuss with you here is to learn how you actually build a successful movement. What are the success factors about it? We already have um, learned this morning a lot about Ukraine. Uh, we learned about the history. Uh, we learned about uh, the gap that is still existing in Ukraine in various areas, for example, between rural and urban areas. And actually, we saw a lot of data uh, where the Ukraine stands right now. And I think one of the sentences that uh, stick with me from this morning is that uh, regarding optimism, Ukraine is right now in a league of its own compared to other nations. So there has been a lot of change going on in this country. And uh, so we are looking forward to discussing that with you. But uh, certainly you are our guest and we would like to understand where you come from. So would it be okay that you introduce yourself in the beginning? Absolutely. So first, I desperately apologize for being amazingly late. Unfortunately, the traffic on Saturday uh, lunch is not as pleasant as it should be. Um, so my story is very simple in a way. So I basically, as soon as I finished school here in Ukraine, I went to study abroad, first to Warsaw, then to Kolkata. And in India, basically, I had a plan of my own, but then the revolution started here in Ukraine, the Maidan revolution, basically. And when I saw uh, students being beaten, when I saw a million people in the street, I couldn't miss that for the world. And I came back to Ukraine, basically, uh, losing my Indian venture, but uh, gaining something much more interesting in return. Basically, in, during the revolution, I created the International Center where we had our social media, which uh, in seven languages tried to tell about the Maidan to the world. We work with the media, the delegations, embassies, Ukrainian diaspora, uh, lots of other things. Basically, after the revolution, I went to the war where I was a journalist from uh, April 2014 to August 2014, seeing how all this uh, comfort and beauty can be destroyed in no time and how there is a very thin line in human heart between normality and war. Afterwards, I came back to Kiev. I did many things in many areas, and basically, I in all that experience, I basically had a chance to see what the government that came after the revolution actually was, so I could never support it continuing its run of power, and I joined Mr. Zelensky as somebody who could win because people actually loved the man. Thank you very much. I think that is already uh, for your 23 years uh, a lot of experience. And uh, as uh, we will come to that, I think, through the questions. So with 23 years old, you are now a member of the parliament and you're actually the youngest member of the parliament. Yes, I'm correct? the youngest ever member of Ukrainian <laughs> parliament. And for some, that's a vice. For some, that's a virtue. For me, it's an opportunity to basically prove that people of my age bracket can do as much, if not more, than people in other circumstances. In reality, the point is whether people underestimate you, underestimate you or overestimate you because of your age, that's always a benefit because what you can do is surprise them. I the way and that's what I'm trying to do constantly. And how does it feel to be now a member of the parliament to have this official function to be a representative of the people? It is responsibility an immense one the reality being that responsibility uh, the fact is everybody thinks you can solve everything now and everybody's reaching out on all kinds of issues that there's no shortage of crises who just want to say m move places uh, the colors on the Ukrainian flag and think mm -hmm. that if you do that you'll fix everything or you change two sentences in the national anthem and that will make our country amazing um, and you know you have to learn to basically listen and answer all questions because the reality, yes, I'm the member of Foreign Affairs Committee, yes, I'm my subcommittee in Ukrainian diaspora and Ukrainian migrants, but nobody cares about that. Everybody wants answers to everything. And you have to learn to deal with that and work with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you explained before that you have been uh, uh, active uh, in the Maidan revolution, the revolution of dignity. You actually got an order yeah. for your uh, achievement there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you also already briefly touched on the point uh, why you joined uh, Mr. Zelensky. But is there a little bit more you can explain to us why you actually joined the, uh, the servant of the People Party? Of course. I mean, the, the whole point is that whatever Maidan was, it had different perspectives, that there were people broadly from the right wing, broadly from the left wing, broadly from the center, from various different walks of life. But the point is they what they were united by is not wanting to see another case like Yanukovych, so somebody who creates a corrupt machine which tries to capture state institutions into its grasp coming to power. Mr. Poroshenko unfortunately has basically distributed the power amongst his 
business associates and try to capture it even more and that was certainly a rebuke to everything that revolution stood for more than that he has proved to be uh, somebody who essentially wants to be all-knowing and doesn't listen to any advice and just uses his own perspective on things to go forward and that's something that is a very bad trait for the leader when I met mr. Zelensky when I had a chance to work with him I I saw that he is exactly the opposite of that and that's exactly how I want leaders to be somebody who listens somebody who asks somebody who then makes a decision based upon the advice given. Hmm. I read in an article about you that uh, your colleagues, friends from the Maidan revolution were not so happy when they saw you Indeed. joining the party. How did that go and how, where does it stand today? Well, I mean, the basic point is that uh, during the last five years of change, there were quite a few people who developed their own little niche in which they were able to do plenty of good. Like the the current prime minister, Mr. Goncharuk, he is basically had the BRDO office where, where he led efforts on deregulation. There were people like my father who worked in the religious matters, getting Ukraine religious autonomy, basically, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And these people basically found their place in the structure that was. And they were very afraid, and they didn't know anybody from the new team, and they were afraid of losing all that, even that that they achieved, basically. And that's why they weren't eager to support Mr. Zelensky. But beside that, there's, uh, for many of my friends in civil society, they weren't the fans of the aesthetic basis for Mr. Zelensky's popularity, the kind of humor he does. I mean, he, people love him for that, that he made fun of the politicians uh, in what some may see as a very rustic way, but that's why people love the man. And for many of my friends who are, you know, Finnish Western Fine Arts Colleges, who have, you know, different perspectives on what is, diff what is acceptable and proper in comedy and style, aesthetic it's unacceptable and all other explanations are after facts but the point is aesthetic is like is the basis of it hmm. okay so w w when you made this decision so apparently you have uh, thought about this uh, this quite hard but I mean at the end uh, you're not just following a leader you actually had to go out and do a campaigning for yourself and have you thought about why people should vote for you to become their representative why should you become a member of the parliament well, indeed. I mean, for me, member of parliament should be somebody who is in between experts and the people, the people and the experts, and basically as a communicator, somebody who can explain one to the other. I've done everything I've done in my life. Basically, that was my job. And when I went on the campaign tour, the focus for us was explaining those ideas that we had since the presidential campaign to the people. And I saw great acceptance, a great curiosity about possibilities of achieving all that. And the fact that people can see now a real chance, a real opportunity for for us to make this country, well, great, <laughs> full stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, because of all that, I uh, joined and I basically found my spot in this conversation. Okay. We learned in one of the um, presentations this morning that nearly, I think, 75 to 80 percent of the members of parliament are now exchanged. And uh, I think the, uh, there are more than 50 percent, I think 254 seats are now with uh, your party, the Servant of the People Party. Um, do you believe that you have won the seat yourself? Or has it been part of the, the, you know, the movement that, that went around the idea of Mr. Zelensky becoming this figurehead in, in the Ukraine? Well, it's obvious as Zelensky. I mean, the fact is that, again, he has something that no other politician has in this country, people's love. And uh, because of that, people are willing to h give him and his team a chance, a very much a fighting chance. That, that is what we have seen in the parliament, basically. Well, the seats we've uh, captured is the reflection of that. The seats we won from people who have never been in, in public political battles before is an example of how Mr. Zelensky's uh, attraction and his moment can essentially spread out. And we are very thankful for that and we are working with the president to achieve the growth, greater change. We understand that. Don't you have any concerns about the competence, the capability of the parliament now? Because it is, you know, it dragged a lot of people now into the job which never have, never have done that before? Well, it assumes the parliament before was competent and now it isn't. The point is the parliament uh, in Ukraine, institutions in Ukraine are very much uh, broken in very basic ways. I mean, you can look at our history and see that uh, when our constitution was drafted, the com constitution that came about is a compromise between the communists and nationalists who essentially were forced to vote for it because the parliament was on lockdown uh, by then President Mr. Kuchma. Uh, th the point is that uh, that's why, for example, constitution has changed with every president who came to power in Ukraine. And uh, it's essentially, it's something that is work in progress. It's a system of laws, system of competence, system of parliament. And when we are in the parliament every day, 
day and we get stacks of paper basically as the only means of uh, informing us of the laws being voted mm. we see those problems very much on hand uh, and basically uh, the point is it's people now with a new fresh, fresh perspective can not look at system that was but build system that should be okay how important was actually a political program in the election and, and in, in your campaigning well, I mean, the political program basically was around uh, free market economics. It was about the fact that we will liberalize various areas of Ukrainian life and to allow people to succeed. The point is that people, of course, looked beyond that and looked at the simple matter who's giving that message. And the fact that Mr. Zelensky, who was making fun of those people who made fun of them in policy-wise for, mm -hmm. for their entire lives, was essentially for them reason to believe in that message. And uh, many of the things we are implementing right now many pretend that it's a shock or unexpected or something else we spoke about this as the presidential campaign time and time and time again to Ukrainians to nationals so none of this is a surprise so was it this program that was the key to the success well, it, this program made the vision of Zelensky as an agent of change concrete. So it wasn't just about Zelensky. It's something about, the, for example, people's power, which means essentially moving, decentralizing the country as much as possible, giving as much say to the people in various matters mm -hmm. as possible. For example, we've done that already, uh, ability of people to essentially put the laws before the parliament directly without the member of parliament being the mediator of that. Also, the free market economics is very important. Ukraine uh, essentially is one of the states which had a experimentation with socialism in very direct ways mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, doesn't appreciate these matters very much and sees that message as some a message of honesty and uh, something that we very much need. And finally, we spoke about the Euro-Atlantic integration, saying this will be continuity on the international scene. That is, the fact that what Russia has done in the East is unacceptable, essentially, and should not be forgotten or, s or swept mm. away. I mean, as Zelensky announces, Mr. Zelensky announces the candidacy uh, New Year. So it was a very short uh, run-up to the elections, which were uh, end of March, if I'm not mistaken. So just three months. And I know that there was speculation building up front and maybe also some, some feeding of the media in this respect. But how can you actually, you know, have with this you know, from zero to nothing approach such a strong impact on the people that they actually trust you to become the, the leader of the country. There's appetite for it. I mean, the fact is Ukrainians are very, very angry and I'm very glad that this revolution came about peacefully, electorally now. Because the fact is that after the revolution of 2014, after the war, uh, the people essentially were eager for fundamental transformations in this country. And the fundamental transformation in their life hasn't happened. If things have gotten worse, if anything. And that's for them a reason f to demand even greater change. And Zelensky basically jumped into that moment, into the frame, and essentially used this potential to a fall. But what do the people actually then transport as their image, as their hope into Mr. Zelensky? Was it something that, uh, that he carried already through his TV show? Or did he, was he, I mean, as you talked about the program before, what was really the, 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 the aspect that carried the people towards uh, voting for him? I mean, the idea was that he is not one of them. He is not a politician. He is somebody who comes from outside. He is like them, uh, and that's the selling point. But you might explain this. What people expect uh, in fundamental ways, it's I can make a comparison with Georgia. So Georgia before Saakashvili was one place, and after Saakashvili was a different place. You can argue whether it's better or not, but it was certainly a different place. Mm. People now voted for that. Like People different ideas on how to do that, what they want, of course, but the general image is that what the country would be after we are done with five years in power is that whole different place that we essentially can give as a proposition to them and their children to stay in and build up. Do you believe the people of the Ukraine know Mr. Zelensky well as a person? Yeah, I, I mean, the guy is very upfront, uh, be that in his TV show and all that. He essentially is a family man. He is somebody who basically tries to be as close and as understandable. He speaks to us all the time about this, that never forget that you are one of the people, that you are basically a human being. Uh, don't develop this star on your forehead, essentially seeing that mm -hmm. you are the center of the universe now. The point is Mrs. Zelensky very much is a, is a 
example of that. I mean, I can only give you anecdotal stories. Basically, after the victory in the first round, uh, you know, we've gathered around for a photo. One of the former members of parliament was advising us. Basically, he was carrying a chair. So Zelensky will sit, and we'll all stand for the photo. Zelensky was very violent in pushing the chair away and saying that he will be just like us. And that's that's essentially because Zelensky is just the guy from Krivorich that made it. Mm. I mean, that's his story. He is a guy from the street that essentially made it in mm. an area of life. And this is the best version of a midlife crisis that he has. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remember that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, just listening to you, I mean, uh, Mr. Zelensky, he must have uh, great abilities to, you know, motivate people, to excite them, and to make them believe in his, uh, uh, in his, in the direction he is giving. So, I guess, I mean, we we heard this morning again, approval rates for him are, are still very high. Uh, the uh, um, the honeymoon, I guess, that was one of the expression used, is still going on. People have a significant amount of trust uh, in his and his and his office, which is completely different to the past. Okay, so. I'll Let's, let's say we understand now a bit how, how it happened. What's next? How you, I mean, with all this expectation, with this high, you know, the, the super optimism that is now in this country, which uh, I guess is a great force, a great energy, what do you believe is actually necessary to make it sustainable? What has to happen? We have to continue passing 10 laws a day, as we are passing now, basically we passing are... Passing 10 laws a day? At least. Uh, basically, the point is agenda is packed, uh, because there are plenty of things so that been, have, been, has been, have been stuck for 29 years in the pipeline. We are finally able to vote on them and get them done, basically. We are doing that continuously every week now, and this from this Tuesday to this Friday as well. So we'll be working hard to get this done. Okay. And are you confident with just passing 10 laws a day, you will be able to fulfill the expectations? Obviously not. It's about implementation of those laws. But the point is that this is the first step, which allows a whole new cabinet of ministers to essentially have the instruments to fulfill people's expectation, be that on in the area of getting the utilities bill in order to the fact that the Ukrainian business people can do things in a transparent, understandable way without corruption. Basically, this is instruments for them to be able to act on, on fulfilling all those things that Ukrainian people expect from mm. their nation. Okay. Yeah, I would have uh, a million more, more questions, but uh, I believe also looking a little bit to the time, uh, it would be great uh, if you could you know, involves the, the audience here into asking questions. So uh, if there's anybody who has a question right now, just let me know and I pass the microphone to you. Andreas, surprise. You, you started to touch upon it a little bit, I think, but uh, my main question would be, what do you think are the main risks for you as a movement to fail? Uh, well, uh, that's an easy question to answer. The, the point is that essentially factionalism can destroy the situation that we are having. And uh, the fact that the president gets us in a room every single week to remind us of why we are here, to explain the laws we'll be passing, to explain the steps we'll be making is basically the shortest sign to basically reinforce unity amongst our ranks and continue the concert the Ukrainian government is becoming instead of a cacophony but there was throughout Ukraine's history. Okay, here go. Um, I have a question about the mentality of uh, Ukrainians because I'm from Belgium and in my home country people are very very cynical about the government and say of course things uh, don't get done because the people are like this and that and etc. And um, we learned this morning that trust in the government is actually increasing in the past uh, years in Ukraine, which is a very nice trend. And uh, my question is, how are you continuing to, to, to fight that and to, uh, to give more hope to the Ukrainians and uh, make them believe that uh, the parliament and the government can actually get good things done? Well, that's simple to answer. The fact is we work. And uh, when the cameras show that we are passing laws after law after law and then we go on TV or write posts to explain what these laws mean and what the steps to achieve them are, that to the people is the fact that that's an institution they can put their trust in, basically. The whole point is you should just work and in that get things done. The whole point is the institutional support for Ukrainian um, structures, be the parliament, the presidency or any, everything else was a single digits before the elections. And since the election, because people have put complete trust in Zelensky and the parliament, giving them a first time in history majority to function, that essentially gives us the ability to present to them the results of our work, which we are trying to do. Uh, 
Hello. During the Maidan movement, um, you were, as far as I understood it, something like a key figure. You were the spokesperson, right? Of, um, for the, the international For scene. the international, yeah. So here's a very personal question. During all that time that you have been there, out there on the street, have you ever been afraid of your life? And is it worth it? Uh, it's very hard to explain because basically when you're in the moment where basically people are shot around you and all that, you don't necessarily think about that, especially when you're young, you know, you have this angst for the youthful adventure, for the adventure of uh, somebody who wants to essentially experience challenge in his life and, ex and prove to the world that he can do this. Um, so what you felt at the Maidan was responsibility, and the ho more horrible it became, the more responsibility you felt to explain this and tell this message to the world. So you basically... You didn't even think about it. It was essentially like one of those moments that you see in movies, you know, when essentially when, when the, the arm is advancing to the gates, essentially, and you feel the need to defend it. It's something of that. You don't feel the need to flight. You, need to f you feel the need to fight, basically. That's, that's, my, that's what I can say about the experience. It was history. I mean, it's something very unique. You know, when you feel history in your shoulder, you cannot shrug it off. You need to embrace it and either live with it or die with it. But that's something you need to um, appreciate, essentially. So. Any other question? Yeah. You seem to talk. You seem to talk about the uh, new parliament is very hardworking. How would you describe the old parliaments? I mean, the fact that the matter is in Ukrainian parliaments in history, usually presidents bought their own coalitions. So they bought enough members of parliament to be able to pass laws in. In the previous parliament, it's even worse because the point is the coalition was reframed every single law. They needed to buy up or push enough people to get things done. And basically that created a obvious reality of corruption within the parliament in every single layer of it. And... Uh, that destroyed any sort of a trust towards members of parliament or parliament as an institution. So now, because we have changed all that and we simply need to negotiate between ourselves and ask the questions to the cabinet ministers or the president to f see the reasons to vote for something, uh, that line of uh, argument is much easier and much simpler. So we are able to b basically go from an idea to solution right away. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Can you just tell us what is the probably plan minimum or and plan maximum what uh, parliament and president want to achieve by the end of their mandate? Oh. Well, uh, basically, as I said before, it's that Ukrainians feel this is a whole new country after five years. What that means is rule of law. It's fight against corruption, not acceptance and the reality of corruption everywhere. It's the fact that we are making concrete steps towards at least making some sort of a stop to the bloodshed happening in the East all the time. It's the fact that uh, we are battling against the oligarchic interest mainly by bringing in a lot more international investment which can dilute their position in Ukrainian economics and essentially push back against their you know their options as far as influencing the government is concerned it's all that but that basically the simplest way i can explain this and if you know the region eastern europe you would know this that the jo georgia is a key example and very useful one here before the rose revolution it was one state and after five years Saakashvili was a whole different place people argue about that whether it's good or bad but it was a whole different place and that whole different place was felt not just by the national scene it was also felt by the people and they voted against Saakashvili because of that they, they didn't agree with some of the choices he made but it was a whole different scene and basically that's what people want a whole different nation by the end of this and that's what we are going to achieve Okay, I have maybe many questions, but we'll start from this one more like personal. What is your personal opinion about all illnesses of like previous parliament which pop up in new parliament? Uh, for example, voting for somebody else, like being not open to journalists or something like this. So, first media. I mean, we shouldn't... 
my personal i mean i i speak with the media all the time uh and now basically some of them uh you know ask me why i don't come on the shows as much as I did before and my answer is simple that was campaign and now it's work so basically i need not just to go on their tv channels and to speak there but i also need to work to have something to speak about on those tv channels and basically uh, some that's for them sometimes very hard to understand first but as for my colleagues you know Different colleagues are different. So some are more adept at, say, structuring coalitions and panels of s experts and working on concrete law, and some are more adept at media. So basically, they top point of a faction in the parliament is that people essentially distributed by the expertise and by the areas they are most useful in. And some basically are working on an area which they can get more laws uh, present in the parliament and some are working on getting as much media explaining as possible. So it's about distribution of talents, basically. Okay, any other question? Andreas, one more time. Uh, we didn't talk so much about the uh, conflict in the East. Um, do you see any realistic scenario where it will be resolved in the relatively near future? And to what extent do you think that Ukrainian politicians uh, are in power of that? Uh, well, I mean, we saw miracles happen before with the return of Sensov and everybody else to Ukraine. That was something that essentially for five years we've been explained why that is impossible, like, that's, uh, that, like that cannot be done, but it was done right away. And uh, so we are keeping our hopes very high for the upcoming Normandy talks. The President has said very many times, and we've ex talked about this internally and externally, we want to invite more negotiators to the Minsk format, meaning the states and the UK, the guarantors of our territorial integrity and independence because we gave up the third biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. Um, the point is whether that's possible depends on Russia, which is essentially the key question here. And back to your first question about the, the problems that can essentially derail all of this, it's obviously Russia and uh, its involvement or the choice that it will have of its involvement in Ukraine. Let's see what happens and let's see how Russia conducts itself in the upcoming Normandy format and only then we will know how fast this can come about. But there are some options being talked about which can make this prospect of peace in the East at least uh, much more realistic than you would assume. May I jump on that question actually because it's uh, we saw some data on that subtopic uh, earlier and uh, it's clear that there are demands on both sides, expectation on both sides in this conflict. So in order to find a settlement, there probably will, there has to be a price that needs to be paid. Some, some, some settlement has to be found. What is the compromising ground that you see? Well, uh, we obviously, that's the whole point of Minsk, that you agree on the security side and political side. On security side, non nothing was fulfilled. There is no ceasefire. People are dying every day. People are injured every day. Um, and beside that, there are many other steps there. Uh, on the political side, we obviously talked about the elections being able to have these elections in those territories, uh, getting people from that to Ukrainian parliament, getting the local representatives elected as well. But Ukraine is a very basic point and insists on that IDPs from there, which are million and a half, including my wife, uh, who lost their home, lost their family because of the war, need to vote on these elections. And Russia basically dismisses that idea, which is ununderstandable for us. Um, the whole point there is, uh, as long as the agreement isn't reached on the elections, it's very hard talk about everything else. Beside that, you always talk about amnesty, but not for those who were killing people, but for everybody else who was involved in one way or the other in the process, basically. But that's, you know, that's the extent of it. As far as the autonomy and something that the president was very clear that he doesn't like that idea. And the whole point is that there is no separate dimension in Donetsk and Lugansk. These are Ukrainians that essentially the same Russian Ukrainian language dimension is everywhere else in Ukraine. They have the same religion, that there's no separation there. So that should be, uh, they should have as many rights as many other regions in Ukraine have. I didn't hear anything that sounds like giving it to the Russians. Well, uh, what Russia obviously wants is a guarantee of us not joining the, the EU and NATO. And as a sovereign state, we can choose our own alliances, so we can choose where we ally, basically. And Russia needs to give up on that idea, and we hope an involvement and of the US and the UK in conversations to push Russia closer to that. We'll see what's possible, but basically we are not willing to 
give up on our sovereignty because Russia wants it. Russia wants many things, not just from us. And thankfully, the world is trying to find other answers to its questions. Then yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Marlies from the Netherlands. Uh, very interesting to hear your story and also very impressive how you uh, got this big majority and are really putting it into action. Um, my concern would be that if you're also going to have local elections coming up and if you're going to be very successful there too, how are you going to make sure that what you're doing is going to be sustainable because you uh, need good people everywhere? And now uh, I s heard you say that uh, Mr. Zelensky is actually aligning everybody every week, uh, bringing people together in the room, aligning on why we're doing what we do. But how do you build the house so it really will sustain for a longer period? That's obviously about institutions, and it's exactly the job we have in the parliament to create in the laws about those institutions key checks and balances which can keep them first independent, second successful. Uh, the point there is this is discussions happening almost every single week beyond the presidential administration, happening in the media with opposition parties as well, and it's about finding checks and balances in those new institutions. We'll certainly be building them up and beefing them up to essentially in the future be able to essentially go on to have a normal system where we disagree about things, disagree about in Europe, and not uh, fundamental questions basically that we all agree on, rule of law and all that. Uh, Karl Sturén uh, from Sweden. Uh, question. Uh, I, I do consider that, well, my opinion is that, that the Russians are to a very large extent very brainwashed uh, with the conflict uh, towards Ukraine. And what do you think that you have to give Putin to be able to sell a peace process to his voters? Because he has to, he has to take something out of this negotiation that he can bring back and say that well, now we have mission completed, we have done this and this in Ukraine, and we have created this and this, and that's why we're now going to give back Donbass, and this is why we're now going to have peace, and, and, and that's it. I mean, several things there. First, the problem with Russia is not about Donbass or Crimea or Kharkiv or Kiev. It's about the fact that M Mr. Putin and a lot of Russians, they think that we are them and they are us. They th we think we are the same nation, separated by American conspiracies or whatever else they conjure up. The fact on the ground is we aren't. We are different nations, and the reason for that, you can look at a referendum in 91, which had 92% uh, voting for independence, and so on and so forth. As far as uh, Mr. Putin needing to sell something to Russian people. I mean, the whole pitch he's making is that they are not there. He's saying basically that there are no uh, Russians in Ukraine. This is an internal question. That's the basic story there. That th this is a whole separate dimension that Russia is involved. So he doesn't need to sell all that. And the whole point of his dictatorship in Russia is that he can do things um, essentially at whim and to drop in or to leave the situations he creates at random. So basically that's the reality of Russian conversation. Okay, I think with that uh, we close this first part uh, of our um, sessions uh, which we are recording and uh, we make a break of 10 minutes, yeah, 10, minutes. 10 minute break uh, and then uh, we come back and then uh, we open the talk show. Thank you. <laughs>